Thank, thanks, Jaydeep. Um, so I'm going to take an extra minute uh, before I get started with the chair's permission. But I, I wanted to qualify something that we heard this morning um, from the vice chancellor, um, the, the naive assumption that that's exactly the kind of thing that's encouraged in, in this place. Uh, and that is that you know, our focus on, on health and education and agriculture in Africa is, of course, not at all new. I mean, these were areas of, of real interest um, from a long time ago, even before independence. Um, and a focus on working with African researchers is, again, not at all new. Uh, in fact, I would say about 40 years ago, some of the, the great Cambridge academics um, spent years of their lives um, in, in Africa um, a range of, in a range of disciplines. In mine, political science, I you know John Donne, the famous theorist of democracy, um, spent you know, a good year and a half in West Africa. Um, and some of his most interesting thoughts about democracy, he says, uh, emerged from that time there. So none of that, in a sense, is new, but the opportunity is new. Um, there's a renewed interest, there's a renewed rediscovery, and that's all exciting, and we, we have a responsibility to take advantage of that. Um, but a couple of reasons why I think it was all that more challenging in the middle there, when I think for a long time a lot of the North in the mainstream policy circles and et cetera left Africa, or at least left these sectors of development in certain respects, was because of the politics um, and the complexities of governance of things, of ideas potentially not going right and actually potentially fueling um, all sorts of uh, negative repercussions. Um, and also I think one of the challenges of understanding how ideas and interventions translate in particular social and cultural worlds and histories. And I think one thing that Cambridge has is not just this renewed ambition now, but also this ability to, to look back on a, a long period of, of engagement and learn from that. Um, so that's my little statement at the outset. I now want to turn to, to my uh, presentation. This month, uh, Africa's Voices Foundation Limited uh, was, was born, at least on paper. Uh, it's, the, it's a non-profit uh, independent organization that emerges out of a unique combination, I think, of Cambridge research, uh, innovation around uh, technology, entrepreneurship um, and combinations of very different disciplines. And we're very excited about what it's, it's about and where it's heading. And I think a real sense that the opportunity that it presents is, is very real. I want to tell you about the genesis of, of this entity, but also the ongoing research program that it relates to and how I think it taps into some of the unique uh, uh, assets that Cambridge has. So Africa's Voices Foundation Limited, this, this new independent entity, emerges out of two research projects at the Centre of Governance and Human Rights, which I direct. And that's a centre that has a real outward-looking focus, uh, a particular interest in Africa, and is very interdisciplinary in the, in the way that it works. And these two projects, um, Politics and Interactive Media in Africa, and uh, a more applied pilot project called Africa's Voices, uh, have been going on for the last few years. And they relate to a phenomenon of real interest uh, for a lot of social scientists, which is the growing way in which uh, connectivity around m mobile communications and other communications, as well as new spaces um, that have opened up in the last 20 years, the liberalization of, of media across many African countries, not all, um, has allowed for discussion and debate of issues that matter in very vibrant and dynamic um, forms on local language radio stations, television stations, um, a dramatic difference from what was there in a sense 20, 30 years ago. So with Pima, we've been researching in depth um, through a comparative case study of a range of sites in Zambia and Kenya. How do we think about what the political significance of this kind of new discussion and debate is? And the political significance here is, is much about the fact that you have a kind of new connective tissue um, of a body, body politic that emerges in, in new forms. Um, and that can have a significance because of the power, in a sense, of public opinion in, in, a, in its real um, tangible sense. Um, but also the ability for this kind of phenomenon, um, in a sense, to be tapped into, this diversity of rich social discussions, to be tapped into and connected across many countries. So with the pilot project, uh, we moved beyond Kenya and Zambia and worked in eight <coughs> sub-Saharan African countries with a range of local radio stations um, who agreed amongst them topics of interest, um, which they asked to their audiences, and their audiences uh, rang in or texted in answers which were often read on air, but those messages um, 
with consent and anonymized were sent to us uh, in which, and we were able to pull out common themes and send it back to the radio stations so they could compare and contrast the views of their local audience with a view of an audience somewhere far away in another country. And we were trying just to see what can happen when you try to connect these sorts of conversations and might it speak to a bigger agenda which is the desire to amplify and elevate the voice of Africans in all, of, in all their diversity um, to the levels of development and, and, and governance policy debates. Um, if you think of the future of the Millennium Development Goals, one of the big bones of contention was, was how lacking in um, real understanding of, of priorities um, the original goals were. And of course, participation and consultation are easily bandied about. But some of what we're interested in is, is this bigger challenge of being able to amplify at higher scales the kinds of views that are very local and, and very granular. Um, so I don't have time to talk about all of the findings of those two projects, but two things really strike, uh, uh, stick out. One is the phenomenon of, in, of these interactive shows um, has a very wide listenership, such that even if the participation is often skewed, more male, more educated, etc., um, you're talking about a space that matters anyway. So understanding the ideas that emerge in this space is about also understanding particular kinds of social influence. So this is not random and um, representative samples, but something that's much, in a sense, more real, whether we like it or not. And the other thing is that su successful interactive shows in our close range studies in many stations were really about engagement, the nature of engagement, the way that presenters invited and encouraged um, uh, audiences to engage and allowed them to speak exactly what was on their mind, not reduce them to a yes or no question or an A, B, C or D answer. And also allow them to say who they were and maybe greet a family member, which often happens on these local radio shows. So you have this very interesting space that's full of possible rich insight, but it needs to be tapped into in certain ways that require a combination of particular expertise and skills. Um, you have to understand the social and media context very, very well. You have to get the technology right to work in, in quite difficult and challenging settings. You can have to think on a theoretical level quite radically different about what public opinion is when you uh, re release it and free it from the idea that it's um, this selection, of rep, you know, a, a distribution of individuated points on an artificial engagement through a survey questionnaire. Um, you have to think about it in a very different way. And you have to combine machines and humans and the relative expertise they have um, to explore and to discover and then also to analyse. So in the story of these two projects, that has meant a diversity of collaborations. Uh, the first instance is a collaboration between researchers here in Cambridge and researchers in the University of Nairobi, the University of Zambia, um, with funding, from, uh, research council funding, but also funding from the Alborada Research Fund, which allowed us to really extend some of the, the, the work that we discovered we, we wanted to do once we were in the limits of an existing grant. Um, and it's collaborations with innovative software developers and media development organisations um, who are working in these contexts. In Cambridge, it's a collaboration across disciplines, and these logos don't really do justice to those collaborations. Um, we've got uh, the in Crucible Interdisciplinary Design Network, um, King's College, which is just actually about the serendipity of meeting people at lunch, a physicist who I work closely with on this project, social psychologist who's uh, also an independent trustee of the, of the foundation, um, and of course, the Centre of African Studies, which I have a close connection to. Um, and finally, the entrepreneurial and um, student community um, as well uh, through the Humanitarian Centre and the Business School. Um, we've had a lot of students involved in the project over the last uh, few years, um, really driving it at its heart. And I look forward to connecting with Patrick on this after we have our African politics uh, seminar tomorrow. Um, because there are real opportunities for students to get involved, which are very exciting. So this is a project really about radio and radio across the country, uh, all the different countries that we've been interested to work in and many more. And Africa's Voices is aiming at that space because it's a space in which very hard to hear and hard to reach voices can be more reached, not all, but more. But the example I want to tell you about what we've been able to do um, is a very different um, example. Um, if you're a 15 to 24 year old Kenyan, uh, you will more likely than not know this guy. Um, he's DJ B or DJ Boy, and uh, from the basement of his house, um, he created a pirate radio station which hacks into mainstream radio in Kenya every a few minutes a day and tells Kenyan youth, look, get up, let's do something about our lives, let's not, let, let's not wait. Um, and he does this in a language that they understand. Um, and he does it in a way that brings across a range of messages, which are messages that can easily be sort of 
hit with a, a heavy club over young people's heads, but he does it in a way that they actually are willing to engage with. Now, this is a, a comic in the first instance, but are many more things, and it's a creation of the well-told story. And they're a social change media organization with a real a rich sensitivity of what makes Kenyan youth tick. And so their interests are all sorts of issues from contraception and family planning to business and agriculture, elections and the, you know, the challenges of divisiveness around elections. They've been very successful in getting some of these messages across in terms of the readership, at least. Um, so they're printing 850,000 comics per month, um, 26 million since 2010. They've got a huge number of Facebook likes for DJB and the other characters. And they're reaching um, an estimated 5.7 million Kenyans in this key bracket of interest to theirs, with a diverse social media um, uh, repertoire that's so not just the comic, FM radio stations and, and social media sites as well. Um, they've increasingly had interactions with their readership and their audience. And this is just a, a, an example of this sorts of interaction, if you have the, the moment to read. But, Basically, a huge number of interactions with over 100,000 readers and, and um, listeners. Um, and a lot of that has been on social media, but a lot has also been on SMS. And they, they came to us um, when I was in Kenya earlier this year with a kind of problem. What they said is basically, this has been really great. We've got this engagement. We often respond, and it's very exciting. But what do we do with this mass of, of interaction data? Um, all of it's in a local language, um, slang language called Sheng, a mixture of Swahili and English. And so, basically, on the SMS side, over the last 18 months, they'd had about 240,000 messages sent. On the square kilometer array measure, this is not big data. But when you think of it as in a language that has no lexicon, um, in unstructured text message kind of format, it's messy and complex, and it's dynamic and, in a sense, big in that, in that sense. Um, so they were saying to us, look, we've done this work on contraception over the last year and a half. And we think we understand something that's going on. Um, in, in, the, in our work. We started with a formal language around contraception, pills and family planning and implants and this sort of language. And, and we quickly realized that this was exactly the sort of thing that young people don't want to be told about. And we investigated the sorts of interactions they were having on social media and we got a sense there's a very different language about talking about condoms and sex and other things that we need to capture. And so they thought they captured it, but they weren't able to really give a measure or a sense of whether they had done it successfully. They asked us to analyze this, um, this, this data set with them. And we produced an interface. And what I like about this slide is if you look at it, hopefully you're thinking, that's ridiculous. That's not useful. Um, and, and you'd be right, because you don't have the contextual knowledge that they had. Because when they saw this, they said, this is fantastic. And the reason was it's an interactive interface in which they could specify um, the age or gender or location um, of, the, of the messages. And what the network is showing is the gray words are sort of the, the lexicon that they define, the words they were interested in. And it was showing the other words that appeared in association with those words. And the thickness of these lines is basically lots of messages that share these words. And they could click on the words or the edges and reveal down the bottom the actual messages, always going back to the content and understanding and learning from the content. So young people working with them were looking through this, and they defined through this the other richer lexicon, the peer lexicon, um, that was being spoken um, by young people. And so the question was, what had happened um, in their efforts to try and, um, and, and, and influence this? So this is a graph over time that basically shows those two lexicons moving. Um, and what happens is in the beginning, they introduced that formal language. And about March um, 2014, that line, they, they, by then they've realized that they need to introduce this informal language that's being used um, much more around on these issues. And this is a, an early indication of, of what the results were, and it was just presented yesterday by the World Told Story to the heads of US foundations, at, at the Gates Foundation in Seattle, because they're saying, this is the kind of thing we can do with people in Cambridge and the researchers that they work with in, in Kenya um, to sort of show the impact of a very subtle thing that we're trying to, which we think um, is, is exactly what needs to happen. So it's basically, um, if I can get it to work, Ah, this is fun. Okay. Fun.
Uh, quick time not available. There you go. It's not going to work. I just saw that message to me. So basically what happens is the, 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 the formal and Sheng lexicon, the usage of them, which is a bubble that moves up if there's more usage, moves across time. Um, and um, over time, the formal lexicon kind of dies off a bit. Um, but the, the slang um, informal um, discussion grows and grows until after March when it starts to be in a sense assimilated and normalized, it takes off even higher. So we get a sense that basically we were able to measure something in a conversation that you could only measure if you start understanding the conversation over time. You couldn't define it or predefine it at first. So you have to combine the technology in, the, in a sense and the computing and the algorithm with the local understanding in a, in a kind of conversation that real yields results and, and insights. So that's our work with the Wellsill story. I'm going to end just by saying that we're doing pilots um, with this research um, with a range of organizations um, already focused on Kenya with a real desire to prove the viability of an independent enterprise like this with an independent research program ongoing in Cambridge. As I said, one of the big questions we've got on the research side is, can we come up with a very different way of conceptualizing, theorizing, and impl implementing um, an idea of public opinion that's very different to the ones that we use when we think of traditional surveys. Does networking this kind of social data with a rich framework allow for that? Um, lots of exciting work that's just afoot. Um, we, we're definitely looking for supporters and students who are interested to get involved in this. Um, with IBM, just for example, um, they've recently just uh, announced an initiative that we helped them with uh, in, in some ways. Um, we're a partner on this, um, of trying to use radio engagement with the government of Sierra Leone um, to reach out with public service announcements um, and public health messaging and, and get feedback and response that's uh, understood and also then um, related back to health ministry officials in terms of questions that come up. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a program that is just in its infancy, and obviously this is a, a big um, concern. But it sort of gives a sense of the possibilities that come from not just the radio um, interaction um, data that we're interested in, but also the kind of analytics that we are, in, are developing um, using a much more broader sense of um, situations. So that's uh, what we are up to. We're very excited to hear from those who... Those of you who want to, to get involved, you can like us on our Facebook page, you can follow us on Twitter. Most importantly, please do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you.